Hello, and once again, thank you for giving me the honor and the privilege of you joining with us here to take another look at the Bible, the story of Jesus, the Son of God, our Savior. It's a, an honor and a privilege to have you join us, whether you do that on a, a Sunday morning during what would have been your regular Sunday school time when we didn't have the COVID-19 virus to worry about, or whether you happen to view the, the message later in the week. Uh, I'm always excited to see that uh, on a Wednesday or a Thursday or Friday that we have a couple of new viewers that have tuned in to see the message. And, and I do appreciate the, the comments and so on that you send back on uh, Facebook to let me know how much you enjoyed the, the messages that we, we were able to put together. I couldn't do this alone, of course, uh, if it wasn't for uh, Lee and Jackie Jones broadcasting our message on their uh, short-range uh, FM station in Lexington at uh, 87.9 on the FM dial for those of you who are listening there. And of course for my son Cecil and his wife Shelby who helped me set up this uh, procedure that we're using to put these uh, messages on YouTube to keep us all uh, informed and, and keep us all together even though it's only digitally uh, during this, this time of health concern. I appreciate all of them as I appreciate all of you that, that join us each and every week. As a a scientist, as a teacher, uh, it's, it's an honor, it's, it's a privilege that you take time out of your busy week to spend some time and, and keep us all together. Before we begin, would you pray with us, please? Our dear Father in heaven, we bow our heads before thee once again as we begin to look into your word, into your Bible, to see the story of your son, to see what happened during his ministry here on earth and how that the activities during that ministry apply to each and every one of us today. We're thankful, Father, that we have the opportunity to do so, that we live in a country that allows us the freedom of religion, the freedom to worship, the freedom to gather together, even though it's only digitally. We thank you, Father, for all of those things and for the many blessings you've seen fit to bestow upon us. We recognize, Father, at this time that there are many people across the country, across this wonderful nation of ours, that are suffering from the effects of the COVID-19 virus, either directly or indirectly. We just ask that you might be with them, that you might be with those who are trying to find a way out of this pandemic, that you might be with those who are researching a, a possible cure, a possible solution, and, and help all of them, Father, help all of us to do the things that we need to do to make this pandemic come to a conclusion soon and that we might be able to return to our, our normal behavior, particularly our normal behavior of meeting together in person, in our churches, wherever they might be. We appreciate all that you've done for us in the past, Father, and we look forward to all those blessings you hold in store for us in the future. And we pray always in, in Jesus' name. Amen. I mentioned that I'm a scientist. If, if you were to ask we scientists, which animals would be classified as the, the most intelligent animals in the world, you'd get various opinions. But almost universally, many of us would, would give you some of the same choices. Included among those would be the, the cetaceans, the animals that include the, the whales and the dolphins. Uh, intelligent animals that seem to have a language of their own, seem to be able to communicate with each other, uh, seem to be able to follow directions when we uh, have them in, in captivity and seem to understand that there's uh, something about these people that's, that's worth taking care of. And of course, uh, you have to include the, the primates, the group that we belong to, the chimpanzees, the orangutan, the gorilla. Uh, so many times we can watch these animals in zoos or, or naturalist parks and, and just think that they're so very similar to us in so many ways. And when you're talking about intelligent animals, you have to include animals such as the, the crows, the ravens, the African gray parrot, these birds that are able to, to mimic human expression, to mimic human words, and even seem uh, able to, to use them at times appropriately. And another animal that some might not consider, but one that is extremely intelligent, is the octopus. Uh, octopuses have been shown that to be put inside a jar with a screw-on lid 
and they've been able to figure out how to unscrew that lid so they can get out. That's, that's a fantastic type of behavior. It definitely and indicates that they have some kind of thinking, some kind of intelligence there. Uh, we can look at bees and ants. They have a, for those of you who, who know much about their social structure, it's absolutely marvelous how they are able to communicate with one another, how they're able to carry out their daily activities uh, and benefit to the entire colony. And of course, they're, they're probably no uh, animal any smarter than the elephants. One of my uh, favorite stories is about a zoo, and I don't remember where it was now, but they'd had an elephant for years, and, and one of the herd died, so they bought another one, and they brought this second elephant to the zoo, and they put it in a separate enclosure to begin with so that it wasn't mingling with the herd they had, and almost immediately, one of the herd animals came over to the fence that separated these two enclosures and these two were in twining their trunks around each other and 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 just seemed to be really really into each other and so they started doing some checking and they found out that some 30 years previously these two had been brother and sister they'd been separated for 30 years but almost immediately they recognized each other and and remembered each other and, and exhibited that affection towards each other of course we have to consider dogs as one of the most intelligent animals. They're able to learn directions. They're able to, to follow things that we tell them to do. And, and if you have a dog like mine, he's able to manipulate me to do the things he wants me to do. I mean, that, that has to be some sort of intelligence. And, and another animal that you, you may not have considered, the pig. An intelligent animal. Uh, Many people keep them as pets simply because they, they're able to learn, they're able to follow directions, they're able to do the things that, that we would like a pet to do. Now, all of these different animals are considered intelligent in, in one way or another, whether it's communicating with each other, whether it's learning tricks or, or things to do, whether, whatever the situation is, uh, some of them seem to be able to utilize tools and, and, and tell their offspring and their, their neighbors, their their uh, people that the the other animals they associate with how to use those tools and some have become ingratiated with mankind even some because they can almost talk and, and I say almost because even though crows ravens and the African gray parrot can make human sounds they aren't actually talking now uh, Coco the gorilla uh, was able to communicate and correctly sign over 1,000 words using American Sign Language. And she was able to carry on conversations those with those who were her friends and her handlers and, and even with visitors. She's shown here in the picture, for those of you who are watching, with uh, Fred Rogers, Mr. Rogers from TV Frame, uh, who she used to watch constantly on television, who she really seemed to like. She met him in 1988. And when she met him, the first thing she did was was give him a big embrace, and then the second thing she did was take off his shoes. The very first thing that she saw on his TV show every day. But she wasn't really talking. She was just communicating. And, of course, pigs can't fly, and, and pigs don't talk. Unless, of course, you consider the, the pig in the Disney movie Babe. Uh, they don't talk either. Unless... But I'm getting ahead of myself. We're, we're talking Bible here. We're talking the, the ministry of Jesus Christ. And if, if we're going to talk about Jesus and talking pigs, we better have a good reason for doing so. And we do. For those of you that are in my regular Sunday school class at First Baptist Church of Lexington, Missouri, please turn to page 85 in your study guides. For the rest of you, you're joining us today, and, and if you're following us along in your own Bible, I'd like you to turn to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 8. We want to begin in, in verse 26. Verse 26 says, And then they sailed to the country of the Gadarenes, which is opposite Galilee. Jesus and his disciples had recently been in Capernaum, and then the city of Nain. And while traveling throughout the various cities of the countryside, Jesus had been healing the sick, curing the infirm, and teaching by way of, of parables. And as he arrived in the country of the Gadarenes, and this is uh, verse 27, when he stepped out of the boat onto the land, 
there he met a certain man from the city who had demons for a long time. And he wore no clothes, nor did he live in a house, but in the tombs. Now, the Bible doesn't say how long a time this man had been possessed by demons. But remember this, Luke was a scientist who recorded the, the testimony of eyewitnesses to Jesus' ministry. And if he or anyone else would have been shocked or surprised by the appearance of this man, apparently no one seemed to mention it. So he must have been well known to, to everyone in that particular area and, and possibly far beyond it. Whatever the situation, the man, or at least the, the demons who possessed him, immediately recognized Jesus. Verse 28, when he saw Jesus, he cried out, fell down before him, and with a loud voice says, What have I to do with you, Jesus, son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. And that's Luke's comment uh, in Mark. It says, For the, my time has not yet come. The demon spoke this way to Jesus because the beginning of verse 29 tells us that Jesus has already said, to the demons, come out of this man, leave him alone. Uh, his condition was, was almost beyond description. Uh, the remainder of verse 28 uh, says, well, when he saw Jesus, he cried out with a loud voice. He says, what have I to do with you, Jesus, the most high God? Do not torment me. And, and he mentions simply, he, he just, he doesn't want Jesus to deal with him. He doesn't want Jesus to be there to, to do anything with him. And then the, the following verse says that uh, the, these demons often seized this man. And, and because of that, he was, he was kept under guard. He was bound with chains and with shackles. And he broke those bonds. And he, he was driven by the demons into the wilderness. Uh, this exclamation from the man the one that was possessed by the, the voice of the demons, was the demons themselves speaking. And, and it brings to mind the verse in the book of James, uh, chapter 2, verse 19, where, it's, where it says, Even the demons believe, and they tremble. Indeed, the demons knew who Jesus was, and they begged him, not to torment them, not to make them suffer for their sinful ways. And then Jesus questioned their identity. He asked, Jesus asked them, saying, What is your name? And the answer was, Legion, because many demons had answered him. Not just one demon, but if we're to accept the Roman definition of a legion, this man was way beyond mere possession. The legion was the largest unit of the the Roman army, a, a brigade in size that usually comprised at least 4,200 infantrymen and 300 cavalry. And during the imperial period of, of Roman's occupancy, which was the time that, that Jesus was uh, alive and, and exercising his ministry on this earth, a legion contained 5,200 infantrymen and 120 auxiliary personnel. It's, and besides the cavalry, and it's, it's this latter number that Jesus was dealing with, all of them with the power of their leader, Satan, and they trembled. They trembled before the Son of God. And not only did they tremble, but verse 31 tells us, and they begged him that he would not command them to go out into the abyss. Even the demons, whose whose home would rightly be the underworld, were pleading with Jesus to not send them to their rightful judgment as followers of Satan. Even though they knew eventually that would be their fate, even Jesus, they felt, might show mercy to, to them. The Bible tells us in, in verse 32, Now a herd of many swine were feeding there on the mountain, so they begged him, that he would permit them to enter them. And he permitted them. Now, recall, if you will, that pigs were unclean animals for the Jewish people. And even though this event took place in, in a Gentile area, in a Gentile land, it's interesting to note 
that these unclean spirits that possessed the man asked if they could be transferred from the man to unclean animals uh, for them to inhabit. Je Jesus allowed them their request. He didn't send them to the abyss. And he allowed the legion of demons to enter the herd of, of many swine. Verse 33 Then the demons went out of the man and entered the swine, and the herd ran violently down the steep place into the lake and drowned. Now, I have to admit, I've never quite understood this particular incident. The, the legion of evil spirits, devotees of the devil himself, asked not to be sent into the abyss, begged to be sent to in inhabit this herd of pigs, and then ran down a steep embankment into a, a lake so they could get drowned, which, to my way of thinking, would, would have sent them to, to the abyss anyway, particularly since pigs can swim. Perhaps if we look to another gospel, we can find a little more insight. The, the gospel of Mark, chapter 5, verse uh, 10, tells us that the legions didn't ask to be not to not be sent to the abyss, which I used to think meant hell, but I later realized it simply meant into the unknown. Instead, in the Gospel of Mark, Legion makes this request. Also, he begged him earnestly that he would not send them out of the country. The demons were in a Gentile country and didn't want to be sent into the unknown country of the Jews. Now that makes sense. They asked instead to, to be sent into a herd of pigs, something that might have been common in a Gentile nation, but certainly not in a Jewish nation. But why the suicide? Jesus certainly wouldn't have wanted to be a party to the, the destruction, the, the needless slaughter of, of that herd of animals. Uh, scholars might, some scholars feel that that herd might have numbered some 2,000 pigs. Jesus certainly wouldn't want them to be to suffer needlessly and to, to die needlessly. But remember, in Luke's scripture that we read, it says Jesus permitted them their request to enter the herd of swine. Mark says Jesus gave them permission. Jesus didn't destroy the demons. He simply gave them their choice, and their choice was fatal the limited power that the animals had to resist the power of legion drove them to a fate that that legion could not have foreseen jesus probably knew what would happen but he gave them their choice just as he allows us the opportunity to make our own choices we don't always know what the consequences of the choices that we make will be jesus and his father know but still they, they allow us that freedom of choice. The, the effect of that choice was fatal to the animals. And I've always wondered if they said anything to Jesus as they sped downhill to their fate. The, the voices of Legion were able to speak out from the man. They, they knew who Jesus was. They, they asked for permission to, to enter the pigs they ask that they not be sent to a, a foreign country, not to be sent out of that area. It seems logical to me that once they entered the pigs, whether the pigs were able to, to just basically not comprehend the, the amount of evil that was in them and, and committed suicide as a result, or whether the pigs consciously committed suicide to get rid of the demons, I, I don't know. But it seems to me that those demons would have continued to speak to Jesus. The Bible doesn't record that, but it, it would be very surprising if the demons realizing what they had done, realizing the choice they had made, and realizing that it was going to lead to their doom, it just seems reasonable to me if, that they would have, have said something. They would have perhaps begged Jesus to, to save them, to, to put them somewhere else. Uh, speculation on my part, but let's look what happened next. In Luke chapter 8, verse 34, those who 
fed them, saw what had happened. They fled, and they told it in the city and the country. The, the swineherds had, had witnessed a miracle, but they'd also lost a large herd of animals that, that might have meant a great deal to the community that they served. It would have been interesting to know exactly how they told the story, the, whether they emphasized the miracle to the community or whether they emphasized the loss to the community. In any case, the people came to see for themselves. Verse 35, Then they went out to see what had happened, and found the man from whom the demons had departed, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. The fact that the people were more afraid than they were amazed at the, at the miracle that had taken place seems to indicate that the, the story of Jesus hadn't reached them to much extent. All three Gospels seem to indicate that those who witnessed the after effects of, of this healing, this, this banishment of demons, all three Gospels seem to indicate that the people were afraid. In fact, all three of the Synoptic Gospels were so consumed by their fear of the power that this, this man seemed to possess that they didn't know what to do with it. They asked Jesus to leave them. They asked Jesus to leave the area. Luke puts it this way in verse 35. Then the, the whole, excuse me, verse 37. Then the whole multitude of the surrounding region of the Gadarenes asked him to depart from them for they were seized with great fear. How unfortunate that there was no one there to tell them the story of Jesus, to explain to the people of that region that they were in the presence of the Son of God and that he meant them no harm and instead would provide them with nothing but good. But these were people who knew not the writings of the Old Testament. Had they been aware of the Old Testament, they might have been aware of the words of the prophet Jeremiah in verse 29, 11, when he said, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. But they didn't know. And there was no one there to tell them and the second part of verse 37 from Luke tells us this. And he got into the boat and returned. How unfortunate that there was no one to tell them even just a little bit of what someone might have known about Jesus. And I know that those of you who have honored me with your presence in the past or who have been in my class at, at Lexington First Baptist you know what normally comes next. You know what always comes at the, the end of my message. I assure you that thought will be there. But I'm hoping you can see just, just how important even a, a little bit of knowledge about Jesus could have made a great difference. It could have been the, the opportunity to make a huge difference in the life of someone who didn't know the story of Jesus or, or having heard of Jesus, didn't understand the story of Jesus, didn't understand the, enough to become a part of his family. They may not have heard of Jesus prior to this incident, but even so, the man was healed. And he recognized that this was a, a man of great power. Page 97 for my regular class members who have their study guides, Luke chapter 8, verse 38, for the rest of us. Now the man who from whom the demons had departed begged him that he might be with him. But Jesus sent him away. Remember, Jesus was still in the early part of his ministry at this point. It might have benefited him to, to have another apostle, another disciple, particularly one from a a Gentile background, a Gentile nation. But Jesus needed 
the words and devotion of this man in his own nation, not traveling with Jesus. And the second part of verse 38 tells us, Jesus said to him, Return to your own house and tell what great things God has done for you. Jesus needed the man among his own people, in his own town, in his, his own country, with the people that he knew, his family, his friends, his, his co-workers, those he came in contact with on a, on a daily basis, those who knew almost nothing about the Savior who had healed him. Jesus needed this man to have a conversation with those around him, regardless of what he knew or perhaps didn't know. And Jesus and Luke tells us in, in the second half of that verse 39, and he went his way and proclaimed about th throughout the whole city great things that Jesus had done for him. What a forerunner this man would have been. Remember, it would only be a few more years until the members of the 12 and a few others would be taking the gospel to the Gentile nations. Can you imagine how people of that area might have responded when the 12 came to them in this area? Surely some of them would have said, we've heard of this man, Jesus. He, he came to us just a few years ago. In fact, he healed a man who had been possessed from, with demons for many, many years. In fact, I had a conversation with that very man myself. How much easier the work of conversion would have been then. How much greater the message of salvation would have seemed then to the people. They had known nothing, but they had heard from a man who had personal, first-hand knowledge of Jesus Christ, the Savior, the Son of God. He, he may still not have known the whole story, but he knew what he knew. And that was enough to make a difference. It was enough for him to, to have that conversation. And you? And I? We may not know the whole story. We may not understand the whole story. We may not be able to quote chapter and verse throughout the Bible. But here it comes. You know what you know. It's enough. Have the conversation. There is somebody that you come in contact with on a, a daily basis. Maybe it's a friend, maybe it's a family member, maybe it's a co-worker. You come into contact with somebody who doesn't know the story of Jesus. Or if they've heard of Jesus, they don't know enough of the story, they haven't had it explained to them, to get to that point where they feel they need to, to look into the story further, where they need to perhaps even accept Jesus as their personal savior. And, and maybe you can't tell the whole story to them. But you can stand before them and say, yes, I am a Christian, and, and let me tell you why. Because you know your story. You know why you are a Christian. I know mine. And, and perhaps in telling one person what that, that incident in your life was that brought you to Jesus, perhaps that person will remember that. And, and maybe they'll take a step further step closer to the Savior. And maybe somewhere along the line they'll run across somebody else. And maybe someone else after that. And it's not necessarily your job to, to stand on a street corner and preach to people. It's not necessarily your job to convert hundreds or thousands of people. It's not necessarily your job to, to baptize people. But it is your job to have that conversation. Jesus commanded us to do that. And that command hasn't changed. It's time that each and every one of us, particularly in this, this time of turmoil, in this time of, of social unrest, in this time of demonstration, when people are beginning to look at the church with suspicion, when people are beginning to look at the church as a, an institution that has somehow oppressed them in the past, those are very real threats to our church. And unless, unless we're willing to take a stand, unless we're willing to say to people, yes, I am a Christian, and let me tell you why. Because to grow the church, to make the church succeed, to make the church endure, is up to each and every one of us. 
up to you, up to me. And so I invite you to, to take time when you run across that person, when you know that's a person who doesn't know Jesus Christ, tell them your story. You know what you know. It's enough. Have that conversation with them. Let them know that you, you care enough about them to share what you think is going to be an eternity of, of happiness, of peace, of glory, and not an eternity of hell. How would you feel if, if you eventually, when you get to heaven, you find out that one person that you didn't talk to could have been there if you'd have just had the conversation. I'd be devastated, and I hope you would be too. That's the story. That's the story of Jesus Christ. That's the story of the, the animals. That's the story of pigs that don't fly and pigs that don't talk. But pigs that played a very important role in the demonstration of the powers of Jesus Christ. You can tell that story. You can tell people what happened and, and why it happened. You can tell them of the, the perhaps 6,000 members of Legion that asked to be transferred to a, a herd of sheep, to leave a, a poor man alone even after many years, and that, that those sheep, for whatever reason, chose to die. It's not a difficult story. It's not a complicated story, but it is a story of choice. Legion made their choice just as we make our choice each and every day. For us, as Christians, we choose to be on the side of the Savior. It's time you had the conversation with someone you know to show them why they should be on that side also. Will you pray with me? Our dear Father in heaven, we come before thee once again having looked into your word, having looked at an incident that, for many, seems just to be a, a story telling the power of Jesus. But for those of us who, who are willing to take just a moment and delve just a little deeper into the story, seems to be pointing to the choices that we make each and every day. We don't always know the consequences of our actions, Father. We don't always know what's going to happen when we make a choice. We recognize that you do. And we thank you for being there for us, to help lead us in the paths that are best for us. Lead us in the paths of, of righteousness and correctness. And perhaps more importantly, Father, for sending us your Son, so that when we make the wrong choice, when we make the, the poor choice, when we make the bad choice, there is a way that we can be forgiven. There's a way that those sinful acts of ours will not be held against us. Jesus died for us, Father. We know that. We accept that, and we love him for that. We love you for that. We just simply ask, Father, that you might give us the opportunity to, to share our story with someone who doesn't know, or perhaps knowing does not understand. Thank you, Father, for giving us what knowledge that we have, and bless us that we might find someone with whom we can share the story. And always we pray in the name of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, Amen. Thank you again for being with us. Thank you for taking the time to listen to this message wherever you happen to be located. Uh, I wish we could all meet in person. That probably isn't going to be possible for a while, not even for the members of our Sunday school class in, in Lexington, Missouri. But be aware that I intend to be here for you and I intend to go on doing this just as, as long as I need to until once again, with the blessings of God, we can meet together as a, a church family, as a Sunday school family, as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you. You honor me. You give me great humility knowing that you take the time out of your life to, to be with me and to listen. Until next week, I pray that you'll have a great week. I pray that you'll have a good week. I pray that you'll find someone you can have that conversation with. Bye for now.